<laughs> Welcome, Bishop Brown. Well, it's good to be here. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you today? I'm doing well. Um, can you just give a, a brief uh, introduction for those who may not know you? Well, I'm uh, Dr. Mike Brown, uh, Bishop Mike Brown for some and Dr. Mike Brown for others. Uh, that's who I am, born and raised in the city of Chicago and then, of course, went into the military. And so uh, that can be basically the beginning of my life, but uh, that's who I am. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, sir. So let's just go straight into it. Um, I have a couple of questions that I, I want to ask you just so I, we can get an in-depth um, understanding of who Bishop Michael Brown is. <laughs> I guess that would be hard to say. I'm just <laughs> just a regular old guy and I would like to assume exactly that's who I am. Just a person that uh, now who loves God and uh, loves to, to do whatever it is that the, I feel like the Lord wants me to do knowing my time is short on this planet. So that's basically who I am. I'm just one of those regular guys. Amen. Like everyone else. Right. Yes, sir. Um, can you share with us a bit about your upbringing and the challenges you faced growing up? Uh, uh, well, I was, uh, of course, born in the city of Chicago. Uh, my beginnings were was that I was born in the uh, in a project area and uh, in an area literally called Jewtown in Chicago. Uh, then, of course, moving to Cabrina Greens. And uh, so my upbringing, I was uh, exposed to a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, violence and uh, drugs and gambling and alcohol. And so uh, it being a, uh, a child of a single parent, uh, never knew my father. So my experience was not like, to me, normal people. I wasn't born with uh, that father in the house, so that influence wasn't there. Uh, and so I experienced a lot of things early on in life uh, that um, sort of shaped uh, the way I think now. Even after coming to Christ, I still have that basic shaping in my, my personality. Uh, but uh, I'm able to use that more now for the kingdom of God instead of yes. uh, personal things. And are you an only child or do you have other siblings as well? No, I'm the third of the of six. So my oldest brother is like right now, he's in his 70s. My other brother, he's approaching his 70s. Uh, then, of course, I'm 66. And then I have three younger brothers. Uh, younger than I am. In fact, uh, we are considered in two sets mm -hmm. uh, because there there are a number of years be, uh, between the one that's after me. I was the baby of the first three, and uh, but out of all of my siblings, I was voted the one least likely to succeed in life. <laughs> oh wow! So you were the troublemaker per se out of the. Uh, yes. <laughs> My mother had sort of labeled me as out of all my siblings, giving her the most trouble. Uh, I love my mother, but that's just how it. she saw me uh, yes. and uh, don't have much to do with that. That's her perception. But that changed over the years, of course. Did you have to battle those thoughts of like being labeled as the black sheep or the, the bad one of the bunch. Did you embrace that or was it something that you kind that, of? That is a very good question. Uh, I knew I was the worst out of all my siblings. None of them did the things that I did. Uh, and But to a large degree, uh, I guess part, partly I embraced it. Uh, and the other part, I really didn't care. Mm. Uh, just it was just the way I was brought up, and so being exposed to a number of things and doing things, I just felt like, uh, hey, if, if I'm going to make it, even as a kid, uh, I'm going to have to just go on with what I think is right. Until a stepfather came into my life, and he did, he still didn't have much of an influence at that time either. So, mm -hmm. 
uh, and that's over any of us, even his own children that uh, my mother had from him, which was two. And so four of us was born out of wedlock. So as you can imagine what kind of stigmatization it could have on your mind, even though you don't yes. know the influence of that till later on in life when you actually recognize it. Uh, but uh, I've, I always say I didn't have the normal upbringing that everyone else did in life. But hey, that's a part of life, isn't it? Yes. Uh, you just have to take the bitter with the sweet. You yes, that, that's a good way to look at it, especially um, having to go through those things at such a young age. So how did your experience with drugs, violence and other struggles that, you know, were kind of a product of your environment shape your worldview and um, your faith journey overall? Uh, Woo. Well, when you talk about the faith journey, that, of course, that came much later. And, and there were some seeds in there, but uh, I wasn't brought up in a religious family. So we didn't go to church a lot. My mm -hmm. parents or well, my mother may have taken us. I can probably say out of the time that I was born, probably two to three times to church. Uh, my grandmother went, but she was a Baptist, and, and but she was a a gun carrying Baptist and a <laughs> drinking Baptist and a cussing Baptist. Right. Uh, yeah. So I didn't have that area of what you may consider someone who learned morals. We I didn't even know what morals were. So uh the early part of my life being actively involved, my first uh involvement with any kind of sexual uh consideration was when I was about five. And so, uh, and so we did certain things as children. Mm -hmm. I am one of those people that was, was sort of aware of what we were doing and how we were engaging in certain things. Uh, and then being, seeing it. Yes, sir. You know, early on in my life, uh, uh, of course, never with the, the same sex. This is, of course, with the opposite sex. I, I just want to make that clear. But uh, uh, but we just I was just exposed to things at an early age. We didn't grow up with what you call pornography, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, you're talking about very late 50s, early 60s. Uh, we didn't I didn't grow up with it. So but when you have uh, engaged in actual sex or intercourse, it. I mean, what does a picture do for you? So mm -hmm. I didn't have all of that. Uh, then get, get my mother, who wasn't wasn't born at the time, she, of course, she drank. I don't recall her smoking marijuana or anything. I've never saw her, but I do recall, of course, uh, her and my stepfather having marijuana behind the bar. And uh, so we would always go back as kids and take a couple of joints and roll them up and, wow, <laughs> and, and yeah. smoke them. But my mother used to give me beer at when I was like four or five years old. Wow. You know? So I grew up in that time. So I can recall saying, I want a beer, I want a beer. So maybe about seven, she would give me my own can of beer. Wow. So, but she didn't know what she was doing, just mm -hmm. like a whole lot of these people. When you grow up with that kind of mentality, you never think about the repercussions True. of what that child is going to experience during their lifetime. But in the neighborhood that I was brought up in, it was very violent. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, kids were violent. And, uh, and so uh, I, I didn't get to understand anything about church until I went with, to a church when I was about 14, 13, 14 years old with my neighbor's mm -hmm. uh, mother. Uh, and she would always ask for me for, to, take, for, to take me to church. My mother wouldn't allow it until one day she did. And that's how I think that, that seed was planted at that time. And wow. it was a church of God in Christ. Uh, uh, and uh, it was a good experience because I had a uh, encounter with a spiritual mother that was very old. She was 80 something years old at the mm -hmm. time. Uh, and she just said, son, come and sit by me. And it was an old church, dirt floor. It was wow. in the country. And uh, I just took a, a liking to that individual. 
my heart went out to her and uh, uh, she sort of embraced me like as a grandson, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and when you don't have family like that, you are really drawn to when someone really loves you. Right, and like you can that. tell it's genuine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so you said you were exposed to a lot of things early on. You, you recount your first sexual experience at five. So um, for a lot of people, that would seem unheard of. At that time, was that something that you would consider was consensual? Because you did talk about how you did know what you were doing at that yeah, time. It was my older brother. Mm -hmm. uh, you, I mean, I, to paint the picture of mm -hmm. how it was, I can literally give you... A, a sketch of how I, we got involved. My older brother, he was the one they brought the girl in, da 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 da. I said him a tale. He said, Come on. And that's how I got involved. And wow. so, uh, and it happened periodically after that. It was, it was. <laughs> You know, of course, you don't know any different. Right, yes, sir. And you don't know everything that you, well, I knew what I was experiencing. Mm -hmm. But to have orgasms and things of that nature, I didn't have it. It was just a kid thing. You just yeah. see what you do, you hump, you do all this other <laughs> stuff. You know, yeah. that's just, the, you know, for the people that are watching, right? Uh, they need to know that your children are much more advanced than you think. Mm, Just like good. a baby is much more intelligent than you think. Right. And But most people don't remember when they were children. That's the odd thing. I remember a lot when I was a child. I remember a lot when I was just one or even younger than that. I can remember times, I, I remember telling my mother, I can remember times when we lived in this place over on the uh, north side of Chicago, uh, if I if I was one, I can't remember remember an age or anything, but uh, she would wash us up in the sink, and we were at, in living in a place there was a community mm -hmm. restroom, so it was in the hall, so people would live go have to have to, have to go out there in the hall, and uh, go to the restroom to mm -hmm. clean up to you know and use the bathrooms and stuff like that, so that was a rough beginning yeah. but we didn't know it's like it's you don't know you you're poor yeah. or anything like that when you're living in that condition so even like your mom giving you um, beer and things at an early age it's probably because that's all she knew too yeah absolutely and then your kid and she probably think mm -hmm. well he's not feeling and getting intoxicated by it mm -hmm. of course I didn't know if I was getting intoxicated either I just like beer you know, <laughs> That's just so and I still funny. do to this day. I just don't drink, right? You know? <laughs> Which is real. That's a that's real. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, why do you think that you you turned to drugs and violence? Do you think it was because that's what you saw? That's what was glamorized, or was it oh, more of a coping was the environment? That was the environment mm -hmm. I was brought up in. So, uh, of course, I had a choice. Like everyone has a choice, mm -hmm. but. Uh, the influence was greater than my individual power to make the right kind of choice. Mm. Everybody was doing it to a degree, and even if they weren't, I wasn't concerned because <laughs> yeah. once you do it, you like it, you yeah, know. And in my true. case, uh, you you feel certain things, you you know, and it gives you a sense of freedom. And and then television and Hollywood didn't make it any better mm. because they glamorized drugs True. uh in my age and they still do today especially among the blacks and hispanics and i think that is a way that they could systematically uh destroy a community of people that that can never build a sense of camaraderie or unity True. to establish uh the kind of economic status uh, they'll live in projects for all, all their lives because they don't know any better. And they're know? addicted to certain things. Yeah. yeah, I was addicted and I did everything I did mm -hmm. from other than heroin. I did everything because heroin, which was boy during that time, we called it boy. I don't know if they still call it that. Uh, it was it was the premier thing. Mm -hmm. You know, but it was straight in the ghetto, man. And I mean, from Chicago to New York, Detroit. So the 60s and 70s 
was heavily influenced with heroin. Wow. Once you do do heroin, you you you're stuck. It's like crack is today. You do crack, that's it. Once you get the high, you chase it. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I was doing from acid to everything else you can possibly imagine. Right. You know. So, but God had grace on me. Yes. You know, it's amazing to me that I still have my brain cells. <laughs> <laughs> because he can restore all things, <laughs> even brain cells. Um, what would you say was the turning point that led you to leave behind those destructive habits and kind of just embrace a different path? Uh, that first experience of at 14, I so-called gave my heart to the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't last, of course, but still the seed was there. Yes, sir. And I think God was just dealing with me throughout the years at that time, up until the age of 18, when I went, it, I was went to the army. Actually, uh, when I was before I turned 17. So, but uh, that seed was there, and God just dealt with me. It was just one time after I had been in the military. Uh, uh, 18 years old, I went back and one of the guys that we grew up together, he would actually, he had a Cadillac and so we would play this role, uh, you know, uh, of going to pick up drugs. Uh, it wasn't playing the role. I mean, that's what I did, but he was a driver. Yes, he was a pretty good guy. He didn't do drugs, but he wasn't a guy that mind doing dirt either. You know? right, so right. you got guys like that and you grow up with certain people. Don't forget the criminal career criminals were at the baby stage when they were kids. True. That's just how it is. Uh, those who embezzled or stole money when they were a child, even when they became an adult and they got their degrees and they went into banking, they embezzled money as they got older into the, just the same principle, right, the same yes, lifestyle. Sir. Uh, just on different levels of income. And so uh, I went back and uh, uh, he didn't drive me to pick up the drugs because I only went back to, for that purpose to Chicago so I could pick it up and traffic it somewhere else. And uh, But he got saved. He was born again. Yeah. And that's how I sort of felt that push. And uh, he verbatim, he just asked me, right out off the bat just said uh ask me why why am i not saved and uh i said oh i'll get saved when i'm like 60 70 years old and uh and i meant that i would do the right thing after i did all the dirt i wanted to do and, but the lord of course had another plan yes sir. And, but he knew god knew the question that he needed to ask me and that question has something to do with a cigarette mm -hmm. and, and God. And I remember I'm about to light up my cigarette. And uh, he asked me, he said, do you love that cigarette more than you love God? Wow. And I said, man, what kind of a question is that? <laughs> you know? I didn't say it like that, mm -hmm. of course. I said it with some vulgar language. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> and, and he said, do you love that cigarette more than you love God? Wow. And I felt so compelled to answer, like, who are you that, like, I got to still give an answer. Yes. And I said, no, man, I love God more. And I put the cigarette out. And I went to church with him the following day and got saved. Wow. So it wasn't planned. It was God planning. And he knew that just that one question that I felt like, man, this was a time that God was saying, you're going to have to confront where you are and really come forward with it. So that's how it happened. And I never looked back after that. So before that question was posed to you, you already started to kind of feel a tugging on your heart? Yes, I did. I mean, I felt like man, <laughs> God was, I would get high and I'm in the military. I would get high. In fact, I would get high as soon as I got up in the morning. Same. I was on the verge of getting kicked out of wow. the military. Uh, they never caught me with drugs. I was very smart with how I dealt with that. Uh, they, 
and I sort of intimidated people to a large degree where when I did have the drugs, I sort of scared the guy to not uh, investigate and come into my room or whatever because I had guns, I had uh, drugs, and they could have, at that point, I would have been kicked out. It would have ruined God's plan. Wow. I, I, I don't know how God would have just... Uh, just got around that, but God is God, you yes. know, but seeing in hindsight, if they had investigated and came in because they had dogs, but I scared the guy and said, I just said something and didn't even open the door and they went to the next room. Wow. And that's how I escaped that. And of course, I went home later and that's when I encountered Troy. <laughs> Bad news, Troy, who became good news, Troy, and uh, uh, I got led to the Lord, went to church, and got saved. So, yeah, it was it was building up. Only the individual know what they're dealing with. True. And I I knew what I was dealing with, and I knew at that point I was trying to get high and smoking as much as I can and do as much dirt so I can get God off my mind. Wow. I mean, he was bombarding me. Wow. Uh, even at times I'm doing, did I ever tell you, a st well, I tell the story I was on guard duty. Mm -hmm. I was so jacked up in the military before I got born again. Uh, they knew I was, we called him a dud, but I was the kind of dud no one messed with. That's, that was the thing, because I was a violent thug, but I was a dud. Yeah. That meant uh, this guy's never going to be anything in the wow. military. We're yeah. wasting our time with him. Uh, and they put me on guard duty, special duty, uh, for a particular reason. And, uh, and I'm guarding the golf, golf course the golf course and I'm walking around literally with a loaded 12 gauge wow. and I had a lid of marijuana uh, and uh, <laughs> God just started dealing with my heart and uh, I just stopped and said okay God I'll, I'll stop and I took the marijuana the bag and took I had two joints rolled up I crumbled up one joint I spread out the rest of the drugs on the grass so I couldn't go back and get it can, can, can you imagine me trying <laughs> right to through get the grass, grass out of there? and this at night anyway and uh, I had that last joint and I pleaded with God I said okay God but please let me have this one last joint and I let it even though he didn't say anything, I assumed he said, okay, <laughs> but he didn't say it. And uh, it literally was close to the last one because later on I got born again. And that's how it happened. Wow. And I'm sure even being living the type of lifestyle that you were living before God came in the picture, you had to have encountered near-death experiences and things like that where God basically saved you. There's no other explanation for that. Yeah, I, th Telling the stories, uh, I, just thinking about it, uh, even while I was in the military, now I want to go from that point because I started getting heavily involved in drugs, dealing drugs during that time being in the military. I dealt drugs in the military from basic training. That's wow. how jacked up I was. I just didn't care. Uh, and again, extremely violent before I got into the military. Uh, and so those are some things I, I would rather not talk about. But uh, when I, you know, as I'm dealing drugs, uh, I got so involved, didn't even go to work. I don't know how I could have wow. stayed in the military and didn't go to work. Uh, but it had to be God. And it was... Uh, one time I was taken because somebody thought that I was a snitch. And, uh, and so the two guys that uh, I saw used and worked with, uh, they were, of course, older than I was. They were taking me down a certain road on I-10, not I-10, but on the freeway. This is in Indiana. And uh, they were about to uh, take me and shoot me. Mm -hmm. And at that time, when they stopped the vehicle, for, I just had this sense and get out and run. 
Wow. And as I got out and ran, of course, they're shooting at me. Wow. And so when I got back to the barracks the following day, this is while I'm stationed in Indiana, in 1976, I got back to uh, the base. The following day, the CID with the uh, military uh, police undercover said there is a hit out on your life because you never know who you're dealing with even in the military yes, you got a lot of undercover uh, uh mps and so this guy was undercover i had never knew him but he knew people that that i've been dealing with and of course when you open the door for other people to come on base you you're really getting into some deep stuff mm -hmm. and uh and so by the grace of God, he said, we're going to have to move you immediately. And, uh, and I was gone in less than a week. Wow. I was gone in less than a week. I, they, uh, and I was so stupid. When they, he said, there's a hit on, on your life and we have to move you, I said, no, let him come after me. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I had my little boys, but but that wasn't enough. Right. But they moved me, and when they moved me, they moved me to South Carolina. Wow. And uh, that's how fast, when it's real, that's how real it was. I was starting to co go up the ladder. I had touched some pockets and things of that nature, and so uh, I didn't know to what extent and how in, in, in uh gauge or how much deeper I was going, but I knew I wanted to go higher. There's always a price, remember? Yes, sir. Uh, and so God knew all of this, right. of course, and he was the one that brought it up to that point that when I got home or went home for one little quick brief vacation to pick up something, <laughs> that guy, I'll never forget when when I encountered him and I said, oh, man, that's cool, too. When he said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a born again believer. You respected it. I very much respected it. Uh, I respected anybody that can change. Wow. To me, I would respect you if you would if you never had a drink because I didn't know how not to. Mm. I always wondered how do people do that? How do you not want to get high? How do you not want to have sex? Yeah. How do you not want to cuss and fight? So I didn't know that. I admired people that had the tenacity and the consistency to stay away from things because I didn't know how. I yeah. had the can't help is to, <laughs> in the worst possible way. So then that's a true testament of God's healing power god's transforming power because once you got saved you didn't dabble in those things or what was that process like and coming from a world where you heavily engaged in these things and didn't mm. necessarily know how to stop doing these things nor did you really want to to being saved and having to you know completely shut that world out how did, like, what was that process like? Was it quick? Was it ongoing? It was quick, extreme. It wow. was so quick that even the military thought that it was a, a fake game or something. They sent me to two psychiatrists because <laughs> they thought all of a sudden I'm doing my job. I'm working. <laughs> I'm saying yes, sir. No, wow. sir. And they're still on the verge of kicking me out. Wow. And, uh, if it wasn't for a major who I had already received what, what they call like an Article 15 at that time for disrespecting uh, <laughs> the major. Uh, and uh, But for some reason, he knew that my conversion was so real, he vouched wow. that no, don't kick him out. And he said, I'm going to make him my driver. Mm -hmm. in the military. So I went from that. I was just an E-deuce. In, in four months, he made me an E-4. And less than three years, he put me up to the board bec to become an E-5. And I went through that process So and became the E-5 by two years and six months. So God did something. Wow. I drastically 
walked away. Wow. So when someone says you have to wean yourself off of something, I don't know that. Just like I didn't know previously how you cannot do something, I found out how to do it. It wasn't by way of having some training. I just said yes. I said yes to God. And I knew that yes was a permanent yes. And I didn't want to go back to what I was involved in. And I literally didn't go back. And I never said another cuss word after that. Wow. I never smoked another joint, never had another cigarette, never had another drink. That was it. I never went back. I just, I was so fixated that I'm going to do the right thing. And I had a dream uh, that God reminded me of when I was five years old. I had a dream that I was in heaven with the Lord. I'm just this five-year-old kid. And, and I had that dream back then, of course. And uh, I had that dream that I was in heaven and the Lord and I was, was looking over the banisters of heaven. And we were looking down on the earth and we were seeing so much crime and things. And Jesus said, who in the world will go to tell them I love them? Who will I send? And he started walking away crying and I was saying, Lord, I'll go, Lord, I'll go. And the Lord reminded me of that after wow. I got born again. Wow. That, that dream, oh man. Mm. That dream I had at that time, it's like Joseph when he had the dream about his brother. And it was after the fact, years later, when his brothers were before him, he was reminded of the dream he had years before. Wow. So I think sometimes you, try, you having a dream and trying to remember all the details of that dream will make you think that you can make it come to pass. Wow, that's good. You can't. So just like Joseph could make that dream come to pass, I couldn't possibly have made that dream come to pass. Mm -hmm. And, but the Lord reminded me of that dream when I got born again. And uh, I have such a heart for those people, man, because I know what it is to be there. Yes. And that's why I, uh, man, I hate to be, <laughs> you know, but uh, I, I hate to be the one to say, thank you. <laughs> I hate to be the one to say that, uh, uh, you know, let's give up on him. Man, right. God didn't give up on me. Yes. And he could have because I had kids and their kids, because I was a kid, that died at an early age. When you see death, mm. you become numb to it. Wow. Literally. It's just another one that bites the dust. Wow. Or he made all the wrong choices. Oh, I'll never do that. But God saved me from it for a reason yes. and that's why I'm here today and I know that so when you were reminded of that dream once you got born again was that kind of your confirmation in terms of what God was calling you to do is that what started I guess um, how you became a pastor is that how that all happened or was there more to it yeah no that's that was the beginning mm -hmm. I, I, of course i didn't look at being a pastor or a minister i just wanted to tell everybody about what jesus did for me because when those people that knew me before i got born again uh of course, you have some that believe you're simply playing a game. Right. It's like a it's scam. another hustle. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's exactly it. I mean, if that's the world you come from, that's how they look at it. In fact, most people think in my former world, every preacher is a scam. Mm -hmm. That's that's all it is. You're ripping off the people. Uh, and so uh, there are so many other details of my story that, you know, you I would have to put it in a book, but in actuality, uh, that encounter and uh, the re reminding me of that, that dream and then saving me, when you become born again and you become free, the truth is the greatest liberation to mankind. 
Jesus says it himself that the truth makes you free. Yes. When you actually get the truth and you understand it, it changes everything. It's never a weaning off. It's never a process. It's just a boom. Mm. It's like you don't get on your way to dying. You die. Wow. You can say we're dying, but really, when you die, you, when die. you die, you die. That's it. When you're pregnant, you're not getting pregnant. You're pregnant, you know, yes. the same thing. When you are born, you're born. You're conceived. That's it. It's real at that point. Mm. And so uh, that's, man, I have a heart for people, man, because I'm that person. Right. You know, and I'm in my mind, I still remember it. That's why I minister from the standpoint not just from the down and outer, but also from the up and outer. Because the people that are doing well and financially secure, they're just the same people that were broken right. as kids that are still living. They're ju they just have money. Yes. And they, so many of them have discovered that money is not the answer. So because you have that, that understanding, because you've been there and very much lived through that kind of lifestyle, um, how do you approach approach addressing those sensitive topics such as addiction, brokenness, and um, just different fam family dynamics within your ministry? Uh oh, uh, coming from a personal standpoint is, is, is a little different, but still it's not one size fits all mm. because it all depends on how a person was raised, uh, how they actually got involved in uh, certain uh, criminal behavior <laughs> <laughs> and then how they look at it. Cause some people are, you can always tell the real ones, mm -hmm. the real ones that they can look at you and you know that they're not the ones that, that play with, Hey, I'm going to be a Christian. They they've seen the games. Mm -hmm. They've already tested some of those who say that they are and they're not uh, and so those are the people that can't stand phonies personally I cannot stand a phony uh, especially when you know to do right, right and you choose to manipulate people and deceive mm -hmm. and wear the mask as if you're the real deal and mm -hmm. you're not the real deal same thing when you're in the street if you're in that street uh, and you live that lifestyle, you can't fake that. Mm -hmm. All the fakes, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> you, starting yeah. to turn on the, uh, the other one. Basically, line. your card is <laughs> yeah. going to get pulled. Yeah, but all the other fakes are the ones that it's a fake to them. Right. It's not the real deal. And, and you can tell, you can you spot know, I've been shot at. I've been uh, I've never been stabbed, never been shot, avoided it. <laughs> but... <laughs> I mean, I've had them pulled on me knives, and et cetera. I remember this preacher that uh, tried to go on the streets of Baltimore, and he thought that wearing his head to the side, he can identify with people from the street. Oh, Lord. And he ran into the real deal. Wow. You see, I never had a problem encountering the real deal because the real deal recognizes the real deal. Mm -hmm. And it's the same way with someone, like if you're playing basketball, game recognizes game. True. If you're a good basketball player, you know a real good basketball mm -hmm. player. It's not going to be someone that's ch trying to wear the mask because they can dribble through their legs. The real deal, I'm telling you, there's a difference. The same way when it comes to people who are so born again. There are so many people on the borderline or of Christianity and in the world I think they're the biggest phonies of all. Uh, I'm one of those people that says, if you're going to live right, live right. If you're going to say that you're a real preacher and you're preaching this thing, do it to the degree like Paul, mm. someone who, who was a killer before getting saved, who knew the word and yet had a real burning in his heart for Judaism. And when he got saved, it became just as real, even to the point where he's willing to give his life. So many people pretend you're not willing right. to give anything. 
you know, you're just playing the game. You're just acting like it. You, you don't know anything about covenant. You don't know anything about real true bonding. It's like when people, when you got those gang members on the streets, mm. just on the lower level, not mafia, on the lower levels, those gang members have made like their own bond and covenant to the degree where they'll die for each other. They're willing to die for those friends. That's just how it is mm. period and uh so you can't reach them with hey i want to show jesus uh show mm. you how much jesus loves you kind of they want to know are you willing to die for what you believe because if i was still in the world i'm going to test you mm. that's good i'm going to test don't come on my turf and act like you are going to win me mm.